Welcome to the Australian Biocommons webinar series. We aim to share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools in these sessions. Each month we hear from our local and international peers who present a bioinformatics topic that we hope will support Australians to deliver their best environmental, agricultural and medical research. My name's Christina Hall and I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Manager. We particularly appreciate those of you joining us live today. You'll have the opportunity to ask our speaker questions via the Q&A function on your dashboard, and these will be addressed at the end of the presentation. The session will also be recorded and you'll soon find it on our YouTube channel, along with recordings of previous webinars and workshops. We hope you'll keep in touch too to hear about future webinars via the channels listed here on the screen. Before we start today, We'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we work and pay our respects to the owners, um, to the elders past, present and emerging. With us today is Dr. Anup Shah, who is a research fellow at Monash University. Anup is a bioinformatician working jointly with Monash Proteomics and Metabolomics Facility and Monash Bioinformatics Platform. He completed his PhD in Computational Biology at the University of Queensland, where he also received postgraduate qualifications in pharmacy, specialising in informatics. His research interests are automation, interactive visualisation, systems biology, and data analytics. Today, we're very pleased that Anup joins us to provide a look at LFQ Analyst, an interactive, web platform to analyze and visualize proteomics data pre-processed with MaxQuant. So welcome and I'll hand over to you Anu. Uh, hi Christina, uh, thanks for the lovely introduction. First of all I would like to thank uh, Christina and Australian Biocommons uh, to provide me an opportunity to present the tool we have developed uh, over at Monash called LFQ Analyst. So before going further uh, so I'm Anup Shah, as uh, Christina mentioned, part of uh, Monash Bioinformatics Platform and the Monash Proteomics and Metabolomics Facility. And today I'm going to talk about LFQ Analyst uh, to analyze and visualize. Uh, so it is a tool to analyze and visualize uh, the label-free quantitative proteomics data sets. So as, as the audience is quite broad here, I would like to provide some brief background about what proteomics is. Uh, so proteomics in general is a study of composition, structure, function, and interaction of uh, prote protein molecules in a system. So a system can be, uh, as uh, Christina mentioned, can be a biological system or uh, environmental system or agricultural system uh, and so on. Uh, so just to give a history about uh, proteomics, the term proteome, I'm proud to say that it was coined by an Australian researcher at UNSW, uh, Mark Wilkins, uh, in 1990s. And after that, uh, I mean, after that, uh, the, the field of proteomics have, has, uh, uh, is still gaining popularity. So, Typically, uh, it was assumed that uh, a typical proteome in a biological system is very complex. So uh, if you consider a human uh, genome, for example, it has around uh, 20 to 25,000, a typical model organism has uh, 20 to 25,000 genes and uh, protein coding genes uh, in their genomes. But because of uh, lots of uh, post-transcriptional modification like uh, alternate spicing, mRNA editing, and uh, alternative promoters, you have uh, 100,000, around 100,000 transcripts uh, in a particular uh, cell or a system. And on top of that, you have lots of post-translational modification that gives rise to a complex proteome, uh, which roughly people have estimated that a human proteome can have uh, around 1 million different uh, protein species, and they call those protein species as a proteoforms. So why we have those many proteoforms is because of uh, the post-translational modifications that, uh, and also uh, 
because of genetic mutations that is carried from uh, your, uh, your, your genes, you'll have the, that explosion in numbers of proteoforms in a system. So just to give a brief, brief background about the post-translation modification, which I'm not gonna cover in this topic uh, today, uh, you have a number of different post-translational modifications uh, of a protein. So most typically people look into the phosphorylation, so addition of phosphate group, uh, so addition of different chemical groups. So phosphorylation is quite common and uh, well known in the uh, omic society. Plus you have different uh, chemical group attachment like methylation, acetylation, and hydroxylation. Plus you have amino acid modification, uh, cleavage of protein uh, by proteolysis that will give rise to a different protein species, uh, addition of polypeptides, a different protein, uh, for example, ubiquitination. On top of that, you also have uh, addition of complex molecules, most notably sugars and lipids. So if uh, different sugar species uh, get attached to the protein, uh, it leads to a glycosylation events. And uh, to give an example, uh, the protein, the spike protein in the COVID-19 is uh, heavily glycosylated. So uh, the researchers recently found that a, a particular protein, the spike protein that attaches itself to a host membrane uh, for COVID-19, uh, it is heavily glycosylated. There are at least 66 different NNO glycosylation sites on that protein. So uh, if you can imagine uh, different combinations of those glycosylation will give rise to a different number of protein species in a system. Just wanted to touch briefly upon uh, different biomedical implications of studying proteins in a system. So as you might know, the majority of uh, FDA approved drugs uh, target uh, the proteins, so they bind to protein and exhibit their mechanism of action. Uh, the protein fields, because you are studying lots of lots of proteins, uh, it can be used. The proteomics can be used for biomarker identification. In fact, again, vast majority of FDA approved biomarkers for disease diagnosis and prognosis are protein species, either in their native forms or post-translational modification. Form. So, for example, the glycosylated form of a uh, PSA, which is a posted specific antigen, is being approved as a uh, biomarker to uh, detect the uh, prostate cancer. Uh, the proteomics these days uh, is also used in conjunction with cryo EM. Uh, type of uh, spect spectrometry to uh, uh, get into a systems level perspective of uh, different cross-linkings that happens uh, in a system. So uh, you not only can study one structure, but various uh, structural uh, aspects or protein-protein interactions using a cross-linking mass spectrometries, which is getting popularity day by day. Uh, plus, uh, proteomics can be used uh, to study the host pathogen interaction. So either can be a bacterium or a virus. Uh, in addition to that, uh, various disease diagnosis and prognosis can be uh, guided by uh, the insights you get from the proteomics experiments. So, just briefly talk about number of biological implications there in a routine general life science uh, type of experiments. The proteomics can be used to uh, study various different uh, protein isoforms. Uh, people have also developed a techniques to enrich particular subcellular localization. So uh, people have studied the mitochondrial proteome, uh, uh, the cell membrane proteome, for example, by enriching the subcellular compartments and studied them uh, using uh, either mass spectrometry or other proteomics techniques. 
Proteomics is also a quite powerful study the interaction, the physical interactions among uh, the, the proteins, uh, the tissue, tissue distribution of the proteins, different modifications that I briefly talked about earlier. Plus, uh, we can also study the temporal dynamics of how uh, the protein turnover uh, changes when it progresses according to time. Plus, the most notably what people are uh, interested in these days are, is the quantitative proteomics where you can uh, compare the abundance of proteins in two or more, com two or more conditions. So, Apart from other techniques, uh, one of the most important or most widely used techniques uh, to study multiple proteins is mass spectrometry. So this is a typical mass spectrometer. Uh, so when I say mass spectrometry, uh, in, in the context of proteomics, it is typically uh, two component systems. So here you have a mass spectrometer and here you have an, an LC system. I'll talk about these two systems in a while, but uh, because the proteomics, uh, proteomics are so complex, you can't readily uh, analyze um, the complex protein mixtures using mass spec. So before that, you have to uh, send your samples through or separate your samples to a liquid chromatography, either HPLC or uh, nano HPLC and so on. And then uh, after that separation, you have to pass that sample through the mass spec. So once that sample goes into mass spec, uh, uh, it first of all ionizes uh, by different ionization source. Uh, so the, what I mean by ionization, so when you have a peptides uh, molecules in your samples, uh, in the ionization source, a particular charge is being added to the uh, peptide species and it has been analyzed by a mass analyzer. So if, uh, for, for example, for the thermal instruments, you have the orbit, orbit trap type of mass analyzers uh, that analyze or calculates the mass and what you get at the end is a mass spectrum. So, before going into further about talking about LFQ analysis, I just want to briefly talk about uh, what is a typical LC-MS MS data is. So uh, as I mentioned before, so the LC part is the liquid chromatography uh, that we add before uh, for the separation of uh, the peptide species. And the MSMS -MS is, I'll talk about why there are two MSMS -MS in uh, a typical uh, proteomics data. So in a layman term, uh, the mass spectrometer is a very expensive uh, equipment and highly accurate equipment uh, to measure the mass of a given species as, as the name, name suggests. So in, in the context of proteomics, what we typically calculate or what we typically are interested in is the mass of a peptide. Uh, so what we measure is not a mass, but a mass to charge ratio. So just to give a, uh, a perspective here, so uh, one Dalton is 10, around 10 to the power minus 27 kg. And you can, uh, using the mass spec, you can uh, slightly, uh, you can accurately detect uh, the minute quantity of masses. So it is very accurate and highly sensitive uh, instrument to detect the masses. So what we typically measure, because we do the ionization step before entering our samples into a mass analyzer, what we typically measure is the mass to charge ratio. And this mass to charge ratio is then uh, used to calculate the molecular weight. Uh, so for example, just to give an example, uh, when we run the mass spec, for this particular peptide. So these are the amino acid sequences uh, of the peptide. So this is a, a particular molecule that we typically measure in a mass spectrometer for proteomics analysis. So what we observe is the monoisotopic peak, uh, which is um, around 388 Daltons. 
but its accurate mass, because it has, it is doubly charged, its accurate mass is uh, 170, 170, uh, 70, 776 Daltons, uh, for example. And uh, as I mentioned before, in a typical proteomics experiment, we measure the peptides or we identify or quantify the peptides and not the, uh, not the proteins. So uh, for the typical, so 90% 90, 90 of all the proteomics experiment, which is also called a bottom-up proteomics, measures peptides, not proteins. Also, I have to briefly touch, about, touch upon uh, a talk about more, more about the LCMS MS data. Uh, the data is typically 3D because uh, in the mass spec, what you measure is the mass to charge ratio and the relative intensity on the y-axis. And there is another dimension called retention time, which you get from the, your LC uh, instruments. And the feature that you detect or uh, the peaks that you detect is governed by uh, all the three uh, different parameters. And while you, once, if you uh, look into a typical mass spectra, it is a mass to charge ratio uh, against the intensity. So typically that mass spectrum is used for the identification. And if you calculate the area under the curve, uh, in the retention time axis, so it is also called an extracted ion chromatogram, uh, then you get a quantitative value, uh, which you then can be used to uh, extrapolate the protein expressions from. So as I said, uh, there are two MSMS -MS type of, uh, two, two times MSMS, -MS, and why is that case? Uh, so, in typical proteomics experiment, we have to run uh, the sample, uh, or we have to run the samples twice because only MS can is not enough. And as we only uh, measuring mass, so if we have a sequence of amino acid, uh, of for example nine amino acid wrong, so if you just do an MS one type of scan and not do the MS two type of scan, uh, there are all there are almost. Uh, Three, uh, almost 350,000 combinations of uh, the different amino acids. So there is no way you can determine the sequence of that amino acids just by uh, the MS1 scan. So that's why you have to perform the second level MS2 scan uh, that I'll show you uh, uh, in detail. So just again, briefly talked about a typical mass spectrometry uh, based workflow. So you have the protein samples here uh, which you can digest it or break into different smaller fragments. So we call them as a peptide separated to HPLC. So LC parts come here and here you get the retention type information from. Then you pass uh, that samples to uh, ionization using uh, ETD or other sources. Uh, you ionize those samples, help, uh, generate the full spectrum. So this becomes your mass spectrum which can then be used for quantitation along with the uh, retention time information. But for the identification, you have to again perform a second round of MS scan, so mass spectrometry scan, uh, that gives rise to, so you have to first select the precursor ions from this uh, total uh, full MS1 spectra and fragment them down uh, using different dissociation energy. And because we are uh, applying a certain energy that breaks uh, the certain kinds of uh, bonds, you get a different ionization uh, patterns of Y ions and B ions, for example. And this then can be used for identification of a protein sequence using a uh, database for example, or a reference database. So proteomics can also uh, not only be used for identifying 
what proteins are there in your samples, it can be also be used to quantify the proteins. So when I say quantify, that means measure the quantity of proteins. Uh, so the quantitative proteomics field has reached uh, over the years has emerged and quite popular these days. So majority of people these days are doing quantitative pro proteomics rather than qualitative proteomics. So within quantitative proteomics, you have relative quantitation and absolute quantitation. Uh, just, I just wanted to briefly mention uh, these two, uh, just that you guys uh, to know, but typically uh, what we observe or what people either do is the relative, uh, uh, relative quantitation, either using the label-based approach with the metabolic and chemical proteomics or the label free approach uh, that we are, uh, that I'm gonna talk about uh, in the rest of my talk. So a typical label free quantitation, quantitative proteomics, as I mentioned briefly before, uh, is starts with a different sample. So uh, you have samples in biological replicates that you want to uh, quantify uh, the, the number of proteins from, so you separate the proteins first uh, based on the conditions and then digest or break those proteins apart using uh, different enzymes. So trypsin is one of the enzymes that breaks uh, the protein uh, from arginine uh, and lysine ends. So you get different fractions of uh, the proteins. You call them as peptides and you pass uh, that peptide samples, you don't label them. So the difference between label and label-based prep uh, based quantitation is uh, in this type, you add some uh, heavy labeled isotopes uh, in here, but most of the times uh, the efficiency of incorporation of uh, those heavy labeled isotopes is uh, not great and also uh, it is very expensive to run those, those kind of uh, experiments. So over the years, the field of label-free uh, quantitative proteomics, uh, and also, so it is LFQ again, for example, is a short form of label-free uh, quantitation. So uh, in this uh, type of experiment, you don't label. So you uh, just run each samples uh, through the mass spec and uh, get the extracted ion chromatogram for each sample uh, by analyzing uh, through a software, which is one of the most commonly used uh, software in, uh, in the context of label-free quantitation, uh, doing the data-dependent acquisition. I know I'm using lots of uh, different terminologies, but uh, Max Hond is typically used for uh, the data dependent acquisition uh, type of experiment, which again, uh, majority of people are doing these days. So before talking about uh, LFQ analyst, I just briefly wanted to talk about uh, the Max Quant, uh software. It is a free software uh, developed at Max Planck Institute in Jorgen Cox lab. Uh, this is the link if you uh, uh, want to go in and look into uh, the software further. So it is a software uh, so which was originally uh, built for Windows uh, type of systems, uh, was used to analyze a high resolution um, LCM SMS data, uh, typically the uh, DDA type of experiment. So under the hood, it has an Andromeda search engine uh, to map those PSMs or those mass spectrum you identified uh, on the uh, on the reference database, uh, for example. So if you your samples are human, you have to map uh, the peptides or uh, that you identified in your experiments to to the human proteome. So that part is taken care of on uh, these uh, Andromeda search engine. On top of that, it also has the Max LFQ algorithm to match between uh, the LFQ runs to enhance 
uh, the accuracy and sensitivity of quantitation. So uh, overall, this mass, max quant type, uh, max quant software is quite popular in the proteomics community, and it is one of the most go-to uh, software to uh, analyze the DDA type of experiment. Uh, recently, uh, they have also launched a uh, Linux version of MaxCon. So if you only run your um, MaxCon searches uh, over HPCs or uh, other uh, Linux-based server, you can uh, run, them, uh, run them over there. Uh, on top of that, recently Galaxy Australia is, has also added a support uh, for uh, the MaxCon. So uh, they already pre-installed uh, Max, MaxCont on their server. And although it doesn't support all their different functionalities, but uh, it does support almost 80 to 90% of cases where people are only look, looking into uh, the native proteins and uh, only handful of uh, post-translational modifications such as phosphorylation. So in this way, uh, this type of uh, analysis can be easily done if you don't want to install uh, the standalone software on your system, uh, or either a Windows-based or Linux-based system, uh, you can use it on the Galaxy Australia platform. So the MaxCon typically uh, was developed in, uh, uh, back in 2000, 2008, so the first paper uh, that came into 2008 in Nature Biotech, and after that, it has got lots of citations and lots of people are using it. And they, the group didn't stop uh, once they published the paper. They are still constantly supporting and developing and implementing uh, new algorithms and uh, new ways to uh, tackle the high resolution mass spec data that we are generating uh, these days. The notable example is uh, a couple of years back, they released a Linux version uh, because uh, the size of data uh, generated through mass spec was getting uh, bigger and bigger. So a standard laptop or a Windows machine wasn't enough to analyze that data. So they released the Linux version. And uh, recently they also uh, implemented some deep learning algorithm to uh, increase the accurate accuracy and sensitivity of uh, the protein identification and quantitation. Uh, on top of that, um, they are also supporting an iron mobility data. So the iron mobility is a, another added dimension, which I'm not gonna go uh, further, but just to uh, let you guys know that, uh, so the data generated uh, from this iron mobility instrument is, uh, adds another dimension. So uh, rather than a 3D data that you generate from uh, the typical mass spectrometer, uh, these mass spectrometer can uh, now generate uh, the 4D data. So the di different dimension of the data. So uh, what we do after uh, we uh, do the analysis using MaxCon. So as I mentioned before, it is, uh, typically used for identification and quantitation. What you get after uh, performing your searches against MaxQuant is a big table. Uh, so in this particular table, a row represents a protein groups or protein intensity, and the uh, columns, apart from other information that I'll talk about later uh, in this talk, it has also got an information about uh, quanti quantities of uh, these proteins in different samples. Uh, so in the proteomics field, we call them, call those quantities as, as protein intensities. So once you have that table, uh, you have different options to analyze that data further uh, to get some functional insights. So one of the most notable uh, software that people use with this MaxCon tables is, uh, is called Perseus. And this Perseus software is a Windows-based software developed by the same group that developed MaxQuant. But uh, you can not only, uh, so as these are just a 
ta uh, a table formatted data, uh, you can also use uh, statistical software platforms uh, like R and you can also do uh, the analysis, uh, the differential expression analysis uh, using uh, the Python, uh, various packages in Python as well. So, so uh, that's why uh, we added uh, the LFQ analyst. So we developed this LFQ analyst, uh, which is a easy to use interactive web, web platform to analyze uh, the LFQ data, uh, which was pre-processed by uh, the MaxQuant. So why, there was a reason why we developed LFQ analyst, uh, because most of you know, uh, we, we run a facility, so uh, every day we run a uh, few samples uh, and lots of, so each year we, we run lots of uh, label-free proteomics experiments. Uh, and what we were doing before we were uh, developing this LFQ analyst uh, workflow or at automation pipeline uh, that we were using uh, Perseus to analyze uh, the MaxCon data. Uh, before uh, going into further, I would like to say there is nothing wrong uh, in the Perseus. It is uh, very great for understanding what your experimental uh, results are. It has a uh, number of data analysis options, but the problem with uh, Perseus is uh, it, was, it wasn't reusable. So once you analyze your data, and if you want to change certain steps, in your data analysis pipeline, uh, you have to rerun the analysis uh, by clicking lots and lots of buttons. Uh, because it has so many options to do your downstream statistical and the functional analysis, uh, it wasn't uh, very uh, well accepted uh, by the beginners uh, and beginners might uh, feel overwhelmed looking into uh, the number of options uh, that Perseus offers. And most of our clients uh, don't come from the proteomics field. They are uh, uh, the biologists or clinicians or uh, people from the industry. What they want is something easy to use. What they wanted is something easy to use uh, that can be uh, uh, done over the web. So they didn't have, didn't have to uh, download the software on their own computer and uh, do the analysis themselves. And again, for the experienced user's point of view also, it was very time consuming. So if for a typical uh, experienced user, what we noticed is it would, it would take at least 30 minutes clicking into various different options through uh, Perseus to get into a solution. And Again, because it was take very time consuming, uh, it was uh, not suitable for quickly assessing uh, the data quality of your experiment, which uh, we typically, uh, which sometimes people wanted to do because uh, there are lots of public data uh, in the repositories uh, of the proteomics mass spectrometry uh, data uh, in the repositories like Pride and Proteome Exchange, uh, sometimes people just wanted to quickly assess the data quality before uh, doing the statistical analysis and uh, double check whether the results are uh, right or wrong. And also it lacked interactivity. Uh, cause, uh, and then because of that, uh, most of the biologists and uh, our clients weren't uh, that happy looking into uh, uh, different options the Perseus. So as I mentioned before, so this is a typical uh, downstream analysis uh, that you could do uh, using Perseus. So as I mentioned before, there are lots and lots of steps in here uh, that people have to uh, click and perform to get into the end results. So the end results, what I'm saying is the differential expression analysis uh, in other terms, uh, 
wanted to uh, observe what proteins are either upregulated and downregulated uh, in the samples uh, of your interest. So if you, let's uh, say, for example, if you have two condition samples in triplicates, a wild type and the, uh, the wild type and the other samples, uh, the mutant samples, and if you want to see what proteins are upregulated and downregulated, uh, you, you can use uh, these many steps to get into the list of different attributed related proteins. So a typical LFQ data analysis workflow, uh, apologies, you can't see uh, each and every uh, box in here, but what typical people do uh, uh, with this LFQ type of data is compare two and more groups. Uh, first of all, they filter the proteins, uh, remove the contaminants, reverse sequences, uh, the proteins that are only identified by sites, the proteins uh, that are quantified by single peptides. Uh, then they have to uh, specify the threshold of how many missing values uh, they want to uh, incorporate and impute. Uh, then log transform the data, missing value imputation, and so on. And after that, uh, at the end of the day, uh, what they have to do is apply a log fold change and an FDR cutoff to get a list of significantly regulated uh, protein species. So when you compare with Perseus and LFQ analyst, everything is done, is automated, and people, after uploading the two files that I'll talk about uh, in a minute, and they just have to press a start analysis button and uh, get their results and uh, in an interactive environment. So, as I mentioned before, uh, the final takes two inputs, the protein groups file, which is the most uh, important file for uh, understanding the biology of system is the protein groups file. And, uh, People also have to upload an experimental design uh, through LFQ analyst and get a number of uh, graphs, summary reports, tables, and uh, also an interactive environment to play with the data and understand the data in a more efficient way. So when I said that experimental design file, it is a typically a three column, uh, three column file uh, with a column for the labels, uh, column for the conditions, and column for uh, the replicates. For example, uh, if you have a wild, uh, if you have an experiment comparing the wild type of, and the mutant, and if you have the triplicate, so uh, this type of experimental design you can provide uh, to the LFQ analyst uh, platform. So I'm gonna try something brave here. So I'm gonna end uh, the presentation and just want to briefly talk about uh, the protein groups file. So this is a typical protein groups file uh, that you observe, uh, that you get from the MaxCon. There are lots and lots of values, lots and lots of text uh, in there, but typically uh, what you are interested in this LFQ intensity columns, which is uh, the protein uh, intensity or the protein expression values and other information uh, can be used for pre-processing or filtering uh, the data further. And also there is a uh, experimental design file, uh, which is again, quite simple file with three columns, uh, with a column for label, uh, which is your samples, your conditions and your replicates. And once you have those files, uh, you can uh, either search uh, using uh, Google or use this link to get into a uh, LFQ analyst uh, web page. So uh, this web page is again divided into different tabs. Uh, and the most important tab is this analysis tab here. Uh, so here you can upload your protein groups file and the experimental design file. And once those files get uploaded, you get this uh, interactive platform with 
uh, different uh, sections. So the sections here are uh, the top section is typically a summary section. Uh, I, I used to say, but uh, first of all, you can download all the data matrices or the data tables, but most important again is the data table with the full change of the p-value that most people are typically interested in are. It also uh, got a, a, a tab or a section where you can uh, quickly visualize, uh, possibly what I'll do here is run the uh, analysis again as uh, it doesn't take much time to uh, reanalyze uh, the results here. What you can see is how many uh, proteins are there in your system, and out of them, how many proteins are typically uh, differentially expressed, either upregulated and downregulated. You can download the reports. I'll talk about the reports in a while, but most importantly, what uh, you want is this results tables and different plots to visualize the results. So most uh, most of the times. Uh, the volcano plot is quite useful, understanding uh, the results. Uh, here, the log, log two fold change uh, is on x-axis and the p-value is on the y-axis. And uh, the black dots here are the, uh, black dots here are the proteins that are differentially regulated. So what you could do, uh, as I said, uh, LFQ analyst is interactive. What you could do is click on uh, the rows or the rows in here, and those proteins will be highlighted uh, in your volcano plot in Y. Uh, you can not only get uh, the volcano plots, but uh, in the results plot section, you can also uh, get a heat map of uh, all the differential express proteins. In this case, around 5,000 5, proteins, and you get a K means clustering results here. Uh, and uh, as you can see, because uh, these are quite different samples, so uh, just to talk about uh, the biological question here in this data set. So they had a parental and resistant drug resistant cell lines. They wanted to compare the proteomes of. And uh, because these are morphologically different uh, cell lines, uh, Although uh, the, the resistance cell line is derived from uh, the parental cell lines, it is morphologically dis, uh, different, and you get lots and lots of proteins to be differentially regulated. The one feature I like the most is uh, this protein plot section. So uh, most of the times, people just stop looking into their data uh, in the volcano plots and heat map, but sometimes, uh, uh, there's lots of uh, different patterns in uh, your raw data or raw intensities as well. So here what we are plotting uh, is the individual intensity in the replicates and how well the replicates behave in either of the conditions. So as you can see in this particular example, this particular protein, the replicates are uh, variable. So the protein intensities are variable. So the they are uh, negatively, so there are more protein in the resistance cell line uh, compared to parental cell lines. There is kind of variability in the uh, protein expression there. Uh, you can visualize the similar data uh, using different plots, uh, like the violin plots, and uh, you can then download uh, the plots uh, that you want to uh, see. And you can not only uh, change the type of plot, but then you can add either uh, the proteins or delete uh, the proteins that you don't want to see. Another uh, tab I want to highlight here is the QC plot sections, which will quickly uh, generate a number of quality control plots uh, to see how well uh, how well your samples are or whether uh, your samples have performed uh, 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 better or not. So you have uh, the sample correlation plot, sample CV plots and so on. But last 
and not the least, you can also do some enrichment analysis, either use for the gene ontology enrichment, uh, different molecular functions, cellular components, and biological processes. Plus, you can also do some enrichment analysis, uh, the pathway uh, enrichment analysis using KEG and React on database. So for this, um, for this uh, system where we are comparing parental and resistant cell line, uh, you can compare, uh, you can see there are a number of glycolysis and uh, citrate cycle or TCA cycle are being uh, differentially regulated in those uh, five, 500 proteins. Uh, so you not only get an individual protein responses, but you can also take a step back and look into a pathway or a function pr perspective. Uh, it also has number of uh, advanced options uh, for changing the p-value and log fold change cutoff, along with the number of imputation options. If people want to now look into uh, the uh, effect of different imputation alg algorithms in uh, the data sets, you can also do the pair test. Uh, and uh, another different options that people uh, or a researcher can, researcher can play with. So also I have provided uh, some example uh, data sets. Uh, if people don't want to uh, create their experimental design from the scratch, they can look into those files and uh, generate uh, the things like that. And uh, there's also a detailed uh, detailed uh, manual in there uh, explaining individual parts in details and individual options uh, in the uh, imputation parts in details. One thing I forgot to mention about uh, the automatic report you get after clicking this download report button. So for this example, I already downloaded the report uh, today. Uh, so what you get is uh, what pairwise comparisons you tested and different quality control plots and uh, other volcano plots and uh, things like that, uh, which is, uh, which then you can use uh, to report uh, your uh, experiment with. With that, I would like to go back uh, to the, uh, to the presentation now. Uh, as I mentioned, different uh, sections in the LFQ analyst. And uh, we did some comparative studies with uh, comparing uh, the results post-LFQ analyst uh, using a benchmark data set and uh, the uh, more biological data set as well. So as you can see, you have a quite uh, high uh, overlap between the results of Perseus and LFQ analyst and uh, also uh, can be uh, looked into a, a fold change correlation wise and p-value correlation wise in the benchmark data. And the AUC is also uh, quite identical in there. And if we use a more biological data set that I showed you just before, uh, you slightly get different results, but majority you get like a quite good overlap in there. And the difference between uh, the Perseus and Max one I would like to mention is uh, the LFQ analyst uses uh, uh, the lima under the hood, which is a moderated t-test and the Perseus uh, typically uses a student t-test in this case, uh, which, are, uh, which gives you a slight different p-values, but the fold changes show a very good uh, correlation. Just briefly touched upon uh, different future directions. So we would like to uh, uh, come up with a similar system uh, with the DIA data uh, generated with the Spectronaut. I won't go into details about the DIA data. Uh, also, uh, we are working with the phosphoproteomics data and uh, doing the different statistical and functional analysis of phosphoproteome data uh, using LQ analysis type of environment and also working on some metabolomics uh, data visualizing and doing similar analysis uh, for the metabolomics data. 
And with that, I would like to conclude that uh, I am hopeful that uh, I'm able to convince you that the LQ analyst is a easy to use, fast and free tool to analyze uh, the LFQ data generated uh, using MaxQuant. Uh, so as of yesterday, we had around uh, 1500 unique users uh, from 55 countries. So uh, using LFQ analyst within a span of almost one and a half years uh, that we made the link uh, provided the tool public. Uh, you can generate publication qualities plots. So you can, so all the plots I showed you, you can download the plots as a SVG format and you can reuse uh, for your manuscript. Uh, you can quickly reanalyze the public data. Uh, just you have to grab the, uh, the protein group file from the public repositories uh, and generate a, a experimental design file and within a few seconds you can generate uh, those uh, interactive environment and uh, look into the data quality in details. Uh, and this is the link uh, you can hit uh, and look into the LFQ analyst uh, and uh, hopefully use it if you have the pretty young data. If you have any questions, you can contact me. And with that, uh, I, would, I would like to acknowledge uh, both the Monash Proteomics and Metabolomics facility and the Bioinformatics platform especially Ralph and David, uh, uh, along with Rob and so Andrew and other platform members in both bioinformatics and uh, the proteomics and metabolomics facility. And so these two facilities are part of uh, Monash Technology Research Platform Initiative. So both these facilities are ISO certified uh, facilities. And yeah, we run lots of proteomics and metabolomics experiment along with uh, NGS type of uh, analysis uh, using different uh, bioinformatics tools. Uh, and these are the two teams uh, that I work with. And with that, I would like to uh, take the questions. Well, thank you very much, Anup, for the great overview of uh, LFQ Analyst. We do have a few questions already in the Q&A box, so I invite you to have a look there and perhaps share the questions with the audience uh, mm -hmm. before you answer them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the first question was, uh, I'm currently using different web platform Metabolo Analyst. Uh, yes, I'm aware of Metabolo Analyst, uh, the difference between LFQ analyst is and the metabolo analyst is uh, the metabolo analyst typically used for the metabolomics data, which is slightly different from the proteomics data. And LFQ analyst only takes uh, the input of proteomics experiment. Uh, and the other question is can LFQ analyst be installed and run from terminal? Uh, not currently. We do have a Docker container for LFQ analyst, and we do have uh, the code on the GitHub. Uh, so if you want to uh, download the code and uh, run the LFQ analyst locally, you can do that. Uh, the another question is, can we use LFQ analyst for DIA data? Uh, as MaxQuant is not designed for this data type. Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, at, not at the moment, so LFQ analysis can't be used for uh, DIA data unless you uh, change the column headers uh, of your protein expression files. Uh, you can find more about uh, what column headers are permitted through LFQ analyst uh, with that. Uh, but uh, no, uh, it, so at the moment is we are, we are working in supporting uh, the uh, DIA type of analysis. So first of all, we wanted to uh, start with Spectronaut, which is again, uh, widely used software for the, uh, for, uh, for the DIA type of data. But yeah, what also what I heard is MaxFond is also uh, trying to support the DIA type of workflow. So keep your eyes open. I haven't tested uh, that thing in details, but yeah, in future, you can also 
uh, do DIA type of analysis uh, using next quantum set. Okay, if you have uh, that type of data and if they have certain uh, standard formats as an output, yeah, we can certainly look into uh, adding the DIA data uh, into max font. Uh, could you elaborate regarding uh, the advanced options? So uh, what we typically recommend to our clients is not to fiddle with uh, the advanced option unless you have to. Uh, yeah, so with the advanced option, what uh, I would like to say uh, people can try. Uh, so if you have a paired experiment where your initial, uh, so, it, so, you are, so you are another condition. So for example, if you have a time course data from the same uh, patient, for example, or uh, the data from the same patient, you could try doing uh, the pair test and you can try uh, changing the different imputation algorithm. The advanced option, you have uh, either option to uh, change it to uh, the pair test. So by default, it uses an unpaired uh, moderated t-test, but if you have a paired data uh, with the patient samples across the different time course, you can change it to pair test. And uh, I would not recommend to use uh, this particular option, but Sometimes people also wanted to include uh, the single pep, the proteins that are identified using single peptides. So if you are interested in those type of things, you can change uh, those options along with the different imputation uh, options in there. All right. Hope that answers the question. Oh, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much. So I'd like to once again express our thanks to you no and for taking this time to share your knowledge. And I'll draw the presentation to a close there. So mm -hmm. thanks again. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, with that, I'll um, thank our audience um, so much for joining us. We hope you found the presentation today interesting and useful and that you'll consider joining us again. And just finally, we'd like to acknowledge our funding. The Australian Biocommons is enabled by NCRIS funds via BioPlatforms Australia funding. So thanks for coming and until next time, goodbye.